Um, and perhaps in a less intuitive visually, in a less, uh, less visually intuitive way by just, I mean, it's a very short statement for it. But what we'll do is the purpose of these lectures is not just to read off of the book, but to provide you some motivation for the concepts and also why we're using category theory, you know, and motivate those sorts of definitions. So today we're talking about category theory. Uh, this week is focused on these three topics. We're going to, you know, just categories, some functors. We'll do some stuff with functors, and we'll end things off today with natural transformations. Now, um, I am going to be using a, a few different books. If this is your first time learning category theory, it's perhaps not best to learn category theory from a homotopy theory book. There's many... There's many good books on the subject. Um, you know, there's the category theory in context. I'll just give you some books if you want to reference them during the next couple weeks. And this one is by, I believe it's spelled, let's see, I before E, yeah, real. Uh, there's another one that's very, very good. Let me see if I can uh, pull it up. This one's on the on archive. It's by Leinster. It's called Basic Category Theory. So that is by Leinster, and it's up on Archive. I believe it's Archive, or it's some uh, offshoot of Archive. Um, sorry, give me one moment, please. Okay. Some, some other things to uh, perhaps keep in mind if, if you know, uh, you know you're, you're, you just joined here today. So how we're structuring this study is, is about a 2 to 2.5 credit hour pace, meaning that you know, there's a conversion formula between credit hours and how many hours you should study this week. Homotopy theory is the main subject of study. So ideally, we move at a faster pace as opposed to the other subjects. What you can expect with this is the problem sets are harder, the weekly reading's a little bit longer, but we're not going to push things to a full three credit hour course, por, uh, course pace because no one can really keep up with that, especially with school starting. Okay. Now, uh, you know, in the announcements and on the wiki that we've made, there's a lot of there's a lot more information about what I'm expecting you to bring to the table in terms of learning things. Not to say, you know, if, you, if you're a, for perhaps an economics major, okay, and you say, okay, well, maybe I, then I should just not learn homotopy theory. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. You should definitely try, push yourself, uh, because it is a very beautiful subject and it has many applications in and of itself. Now, this study for us doesn't take on the whole book by Strom. But we do cover what would be typically covered in any course on algebraic topology. We have a strong emphasis on homotopy, uh, but we also do cover things like homology and cohomology. And there will be deep into the future, you know, discussion of the theory of compact surfaces. But the, the way that it's presented is in a, in a, in a very advanced uh, way. So if you want, you can let this serve. You will certainly have the tools after this study to go on and study other subjects that rely on algebraic topology, is what I'm saying. So this will prepare you for, if you wanted to learn more about differential topology, if you want to more learn, more, learn more about, you know, three manifolds, low to, not theory, all those sorts of things that may rely on algebraic topology, this course will, of course, set you up for that, okay? Uh, before I get to the content, are there any questions so far? Okay. All right. Well, with that, we might as well get into it. Um, maybe we'll just start, you know, section one of this lecture. We're going to talk about categories and diagrams. So the idea of a category is that, that you know, so you can look at it in many different ways. It's a, some might say it's a generalization of a set. How you can think, the best way that I like to think about it is just, you just analogize, you know, just examples really make things clear. So I'll state the definition of the category, and then after I've stated the definition, 
we'll play with the definition a little bit and then I'll give you some concrete examples so that you know for sure you have a good sense of what a category is. We're not going to go in uh, to a depth that's like uh, you know categories for the working mathematicians that book is very advanced for the subject but you can certainly explore afterwards okay so definition one a category which we usually denote with a cursive or script letter C consists of two things Just underline category the first thing is a, and I'll put it in quotes, collection of objects. And this collection, in quotes, is not necessarily a set. There's some pedantic there with the definition, so don't look into it too much for now. Just think, okay, it's a collection of objects, bare minimum, bare minimum. I know I said it's not necessarily a set, but you can think it's a set if that helps you digest the definition. It's a collection of objects of C and it is denoted simply OBC. Okay, that's the first thing. The second part, which is a little bit more del delicate, we require, so we require for any two objects, so IE, X and Y are in this collection of objects we've been talking about. There exists a set, and this is in fact a set this time, of morphisms, a set between X and Y. Okay, and this set is denoted by MOR, you denote the category as a subscript, and then X, Y. Now what do I mean by morphism uh, between X and Y. So, so we think about this idea of a function of a map, okay? Instead of talking about things in, you know, domains and codomains, we use this kind of category theory definition. We're really talking about, you know, F is in this set of morphisms. If, you know, F is, if you want a map from X to Y, we call X the source or also the, the domain, and why we call the target, or the codomain, I'll just say target. The book does this weird thing, it uses domain for X, and then it'll use target for Y instead of domain and codomain, so just keep that in mind, okay. These morphisms, they have to satisfy uh, three properties, so morphisms are required to satisfy. first property, we require that we can compose them. So with a, with a set of morphisms, there's a notion of composition. So existence or notion of composition. And what I'll do here, and when the category is clear, I'll usually omit the subscript here just to save time writing. But if I have X, Y, and Z objects, and I'll just, well, I can just write that. If I have F as a morphism from X to Y, and I have G as a morphism from Y to Z, there exists a morphism, I'll just call it H, from X to Z, such that we define H as the composite of G and F. Okay, so we just can, there's this notion of composing morphisms together. Okay, so that, that exists. Now that operation of composition, so we're talking about morphisms on this page. That operation, I guess if you will, of composition is required to satisfy a, one property, which is associativity. This is perhaps the easiest definition to digest. Everyone's seen this. It's the most boring to check. But basically, I can compose in any manner in terms of shifting the parentheses around in my composition. The third is that we require there to be an identity morphism. Okay, you can see in some sense, this is kind of like, and it does say in the book, that you can actually view 
a group as a category with one object. Um, and you know you have this associativity, you have the identity. Okay, and there's certainly inverses which we'll talk about. But anyway, I, that's I digress. The last requirement for the set of morphisms is that there is an existence of the identity. What does this mean? This means for any object x, we'll just I'll end up stop. I will eventually stop writing x as in the object of C if if the category is clear. Capital last of the Latin alphabet, last of the English alphabet letters will denote objects, you know, and you know lowercase letters F, G, H are going to be morphisms. So eventually for speed I will stop writing these things. Okay, but for any object X, there exists a special morphism. Let me just say it's special because it's the identity. Special morphism, which we denote by IDX for the identity map on X which is of course a morphism from x to x such that for any function you know that's a morphism from w to x we get that the identity map composed with f and we can do the composition because f's target is x that's equal to f and then likewise if we have g which is sourced in x and then outputs to w so one has the, the reverse case. So G composed with the identity map is equal to G. Okay, Just as you would expect the identity map to behave. No surprises with that. Just give me a moment. I'm going to check BC tag. Okay. So with this, we kind of use, I know the, uh, the author... You know, he introduces diagrams for us. We're going to use, we're using these categories. I'm just going to kind of talk to you for those who you know category theory to, you know, if you're not learning anything here because you know it already, you can at least learn somewhat maybe from the presentation if you want. If you were to explain this to someone in the future, what would be the best route to take? But anyway, we can visualize. So this subsection is going to be about visualizing interactions between objects and morphisms. And how do we do that? Well, we use a diagram, okay? So we're going to say let C be a category and X and Y be objects. Okay, category is clear. I'll just write OB. Okay, if F is a morphism from X to Y, its diagram representation is just a directed graph. So what we do is we write down x, we write down y, and we write f as a directed arrow from x to y, and we label that arrow, we write a nice arrow, we label that arrow f. Not a big deal, okay? Now, with this, we can add in multiple objects. So if I wanted another object z, and I had an object g, I can form the composite, and this is, in fact, the first part of the morphism property visualized, I can write, I should really uh, say that there exists that composite arrow G composed with F from X to Z. And when I, when in category theory, when you write an existence statement in a diagram, you'll put a dotted arrow. So what you would read this, uh, read this diagram as is, is we have a morphism from X to Y, we have a morphism from Y to Z, and we're claiming or we're stating that there exists another morphism G composed with F from X to Z, where if I follow this arrow, it's the same as following this path. Okay, so basically what this is to say, really what this says is F then G is equal to G composed with F. Okay, so if I start at X and I go to Z, no matter what path I take, it's the same evaluation in a you would you know if we were talking about sets in an evaluation sense. Okay, so in the case of this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, and I'll and I'll just write this as a definition. If 
all composite paths between any two vertices. So the so when we write our objects on a diagram, we call them vertices. Between any two vertices on a diagram are equal, we say that the diagram is commutative. Is commutative. Okay? So a commutative diagram, no matter which path I take, as long as I start at the same spot and end at the same, same spot, or, or as another map, those evaluations are the same. So let me just give you a quick example of what I mean by that. A uh, more concrete example by evaluation since we're working with objects. If I take, let's say, let me take this diagram where R is the real line, C is the complex plane, and then we have R down here. I'm going to describe to you a variety of maps. So we have e to the i theta. Okay, you may, if you've taken complex variables, you know everyone has some general idea of what this does. So r, you'll input a real number as theta, and it outputs a complex number. Okay, and then we're going to define there to be a map from r to c as the identity function, and then, uh, oh, this should be c down here. I'm sorry. Where's the eraser? There we go. That's not r. That's c. And then we're going to define another function from r to c, namely cosine of theta plus i sine theta. Now by de Moivre's formula, if you've seen it before, these two values are equal. So what you have here is we have one path going from r to c, which is taking e to the i theta, okay, composed by the identity function on c. Okay, well that's one path. But that is of course equal to the other path that we could take, okay, so this is the one path here. And then the other path we could take is just cosine of theta plus i sine theta. And that's equal to e to the i theta. And so hence this diagram commutes, right? We can take any path and we get the same computation evaluation. Okay, so that's what we mean by a commutative diagram. Okay. Um, let's see, what else should I cover? I guess we'll talk about the other properties that I talked about. So the existence of an identity, so when I want to talk about the existence of the identity morphism. What I'm really saying is that there exists a function such that a certain diagram commutes. So I could write that as, it'll take me just a minute to write this out, but we have, if you remember F, that was a morphism from some domain W to a target X. We have that identity function on X, and then we have Okay, what we required was part of the definition, this is a pretty ugly diagram, but it's okay. What we, what we required for part of the definition, the, the requirement of identity function, is that if I compose f, uh, oops, sorry, this should be x. If I take the identity function composed with f, that should equal f, right? So this diagram commutes because id x composed with f is equal to f. Okay, so this path is equal to this path here. Okay, so the diagram commutes. The second requirement was that the other way, okay, if we compose the in the other way, okay, that this part of the diagram is commutative. Okay, and that was just to say that G composed with the identity function is equal to G. Okay, so we could rewrite that requirement for there to be uh, an identity morphism by just saying there exists a function here there exists a function here such that this whole diagram commutes, and that's it. Okay, so kind of a good way to see how we can use diagrams to draw our arguments out, and we'll be using diagrams to make arguments. We'll do things called di we'll do stuff called diagram chasing, but you can already sort of see some usefulness, and we'll look at some more usefulness uh, in a second. Okay. So I want to move on to some examples of categories. It's good to have a, a decent supply of examples. What I'm not going to do for those who were here for the other talks, I'm not going to talk about a bunch of weird normed vector spaces or anything. I'm going to give you some algebraic categories because those are the most relevant. So but I want to give you some examples of categories. The first cat category, and it's a very important one, there's the category. Let me see if I can write this G right. 
category G or GRP of groups. Now this category has the following data. The objects are just groups in the classical sense. Okay, so again remember some group theory, remember the definition of a group. The objects of this category, it just contains all the groups. Okay, the morphisms, you might think, oh well morphisms, you know, what are the coolest maps between groups? Those are obviously going to be the isomorphisms, right? Nope, the morphisms is the set of all homomorphisms. between those two groups, G and H. You can check this as a category. You have the existence of that identity, you know, the identity, uh, the group identity, that's a homomorphism, and all that jazz. Okay, so wait, that didn't make any sense. Ignore what I just said. So, But again, this is a very important category. If you want to talk about abelian groups, I'll just put this here, because this will come up, but it's not worth writing the whole definition down in its own right. We write the abelian, the category of abelian groups with this. And in this case, the objects will be abelian groups. The morphisms stay as group homomorphisms. A little bit more, uh, I want to show you one more application, or one or two more applications of, of using a diagram for something to get a little bit more comfortable with it in a, in a more grounded sense. And, and that is visualizing the first isomorphism theorem which is a very classical theorem in first semester algebra. Well, basically you say, if I have a group homomorphism between two groups, G to H, then we have this normal subgroup. There's a normal subgroup part of this, I'm gonna ignore it. But then the main treat of this theorem is that you have this nice isomorphism, which is your G modded the kernel of your homomorphism. So remember that the kernel of a homomorphism is all the fun all the el all the elements in the domain that map to the identity. Okay, G mod that you have uh, you have the group of all the cosets. Okay, so your elements of of G mod kernel would be like you know G if G is an element of the group times kernel phi. So you multiply each element of the kernel by G. Okay, so that's what I mean by quotient group here. But you have G mod out the kernel. That's isomorphic to the image of G. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, anytime you see an isomorphism that looks this crazy, it's pretty cool. But you can represent this as uh, in diagrams. You can represent this problem in diagrams because what it's proposing is that there exists an isomorphism. Okay, so we can write that dotted arrow and an exists symbol somehow. So we have G. Okay, the relevant parts of, of this statement, which is what we're going to represent in a diagram. Okay, we have G. We have G mod out that kernel. And then we have the image phi of G. Well, G gets sent to phi of G under phi, so we can fill in that map there. G gets sent to G mod out the kernel using the canonical projection where we take an element g of the group, little g of the group, and map it to g left operation, left times the uh, coset, I mean, sorry, left times the set kernel, okay. Well, the first isomorphism theorem says in diagrams is that there exists uh, a homomorphism here such that this diagram commutes, and that should be dotted. exists a homomorphism there of the, the diagram commutes and, and if you go through the proof and I'm not going to go through the proof there's no use doing it it's pretty easy you just take right elements of that quotient group or of this form you take this and you map it to you know, what you multiplied that uh, set by okay oh sorry that should be uh, phi of G and you evaluated it at uh, at G okay and you can see that this commutes. If I take, you know, I'll say H because it's kind of confusing. I'm using G. If I take H, okay, H maps to H times the kernel of phi under pi, the projection. And then under psi of how we defined it, that gets mapped to phi of H. Okay, and of course, H maps to phi of H taking this direction. So this diagram would commute. Okay, so there's an employment in terms of... Uh, uh, 
group theory that we can use diagrams to visualize certain scenarios. And there's two other exercises that ask you to visualize the second and third. If you would like to, it's not on the homework, but just more showing you why diagrams can be pretty useful. Okay, another example which we will be using today for natural transformations will be the category vect k of k-dimensional vector spaces. Okay, the objects k-dimensional vector spaces, and I'll just put v spaces. Okay, the morphisms are, let's say, the morphisms from x to y. x and y are k vector spaces, k-dimensional vector spaces. That's the set of linear maps between x and y. So remember what I mean by linear, okay? You can distribute your function across addition, and you can pull out scalars. So that's what I mean by a linear map. So that's another category. We'll be working with that a little bit more closely today. The third one that we'll also be working with today is the category top of topological spaces. And since you all, I would hope, know topology, I could just say this out loud. Your objects, what are they going to be? They're going to be topological spaces. So any space that's a topological space. Your morphisms are going to be continuous maps. And I remember for topological spaces, we define a continuous map in the sense that the pre-image of every open set, every set that is open in the target is open in the domain. Okay, so the pre-image of open sets are open. So that's what makes a continuous map. And there you go, you have the category of topological spaces. Okay. Uh, I think that's enough. I, I hope you guys kind of get the general sense of what a category is. It's a very simple definition. It's just, you know, bringing things together. So we have topological spaces and continuous maps all in one class or family or whatever. Okay, so that's enough. I think it's time to kind of get off categories and talk about morphisms a little bit more. So we'll say section 1.2, morphisms. Okay. Uh, we're going to mainly talk about special types of morphisms because there is some, you know, stuff that we can do. Uh, you know, there's there we have a morphism in top in topological category. That's a continuous map. We want this notion, this general notion of a homeomorphism, of an isomorphism between groups, uh, of an isomorphism, isomorphism between vector spaces. We want to bundle that all together as what is the general thing that's going on there when we identify objects of our category together. And we do that by saying a morphism, and we'll just, you know, let C be our ambient category. So F maps X to Y is an equivalence or isomorphism, as is more commonly said, but I will um, be consistent with the language the book uses. If there is an inverse morphism, this is me just adding to what the author's definition, going in the opposite direction, such that when I compose G with F, that is equal to the identity on X, and when I composed F with G, that is equal to the identity on Y. Okay, and usually G is written, maybe I should do this. We usually write G as F inverse, F to the negative one. Okay. Now this uh, inverse, we'll call it claim one, G equal F inverse is unique for each f. Okay, so it behaves like a usually an inverse is always unique. So uh, an equivalence behaves just as you would expect it to. I mean, the inverse of, of a morphism, in, in a, uh, the inverse of an equivalence, excuse me, behaves exactly as you would expect it to. So I'll just jot down a short proof for this, okay? What we have here is you can write g composed with f, composed with G prime, let's say G prime is another inverse for F. Now we can switch these two because they're both inverses. They both behave the same. So that's going to be equal to G prime composed with F composed with G. Okay. 
we can write that for sure because these, you know, this is the identity, you know, this is the identity and all that, all that stuff, right? This is a, a commutative thing. Okay, well that implies I can say, okay, well we can replace that by the identity and we can also replace this by the identity since G is an inverse, okay, so we get G composed with, what would that be? That would be the identity on Y and that's equal to G prime composed with, that would be the identity on X, okay, and of course this implies that G is equal to G prime. So it behaves just as you would expect for any inverse. Let me just check if I made. Uh, okay, just checking to see if you guys made any comments. Uh, if you need to point something out. Okay, there's some other ones. I mean, you should probably feel very comfortable with this. Um, you know, I'm not going to prove this claim. Uh, I want to be able to move forward with this. But uh, equivalence, equivalence, and I should say, if there, are, if we have two objects in a category and there's an equivalence, we say that those two objects are equivalent. And so in this case, equivalence between objects defines, what do you think I'm going to write? Equivalence relation. And equivalence relation. Not a very tough thing to see. Okay. But nonetheless, this actually leads us, if you wanted to start thinking about it now. So again, in the daily brief, in the weekly briefs, excuse me, I have a problem set for the week typed up for you to complete by the next lecture. And the first problem on your problem set is going to be, you know, for a category C, so let C be a category, and let F, mapping between two objects, a morphism, with a left inverse, G mapping Y to X, okay? Meaning that G composed with F, right? Left side inverse is equal to the identity map, and that would be on Y, okay? Let's see, be a category, a morphism, what I want you, uh, and F is a morphism with a left inverse. I want you to suppose further that G also has a left inverse. So the left inverse of F also has a left inverse. So suppose G has a left inverse. What I want you to just what, what I want you to show I want you to show that F and G are two-sided inverses for each other. It was the first first exercise on your homework. Very easy, straightforward, good employment of what we've learned so far. Okay. So something to think about in your spare time, but we're not going to prove it here. That's for you to do. Okay. I want to. I guess we'll talk a little bit more about morphisms. Might as well. Um, you know, I promised you at the beginning that we'd motivate some things using combinatorial algebraic topology instead of point using uh, categories and learning that in a vacuum. Still on morphisms, I want to talk about some special types of morphisms, but we're going to work in top. So for this page, we're going to let C be the topological category, okay? Objects, topological spaces, morphisms, continuous maps. Definition. Let X be in the object of top. That's a pretty quick way to say let X be a topological space. And A, a subspace of X. What do I mean by subspace? I mean subspace in the topological sense. Open sets in A are defined as intersections of open sets in X with A. Okay? We define, we say that a continuous map that takes X to that subspace A. So let me just draw a picture of the scenario. Here's X. Here's your subspace A. A continuous map is called a retract of X if R restricted to A is equal to the identity map on A. Okay, so R of A is equal to A for all A in A, and that's subspace A. Okay. 
now we have a function that is called a retract. We can say the subspace is said to be a retract of x. Oh, that's an ugly x. If the restriction, oh, if, uh, oh, here we go, for the inclusion map, which basically takes A and just places it in X, okay? So the inclusion map is the identity map on A that places it in X, okay? We have that, that retract, we have that there exists a retraction R such that R composed with the inclusion is equal to the identity map on A, okay? So if a retract exists, that when composed with the inclusion map is equal to the identity on that subspace, we say that that subspace is a retract of that overall topological space. The, the, the nomenclature for it is, is very visual, okay? Now what I'm going to draw, if you want to get pedantic for those who know algebraic topology, it's just, a, it's, I think it's technically a deformation retract what I'm drawing for all of these examples, but nonetheless it's a retract. Basically what you can view this as, here's your subspace A, here's your topological space X. That retraction map A is an onto function. Realize that because uh, it's, it's, it's the identity map on A itself. So all the elements of A are mapped to. Okay. What you can view is, is this just sucks X down to A. Okay. And so all you're left with is A once you've performed the evaluation. Okay, um, another one, I'll just get, I kind of like the visuals for these. Another one that's given in Hatcher, you've certainly seen this one before. You take a letter A, you write it in, in, in bold, I guess you would say, and then you say that your subspace, which I'll put in blue, is kind of the, the wireframe, if you will, of the letter. Okay, in the retraction, pulls all of these black lines, all of, well, the space, pulls these black lines and sucks it down to the wireframe. Okay. Another one, I'll give you one more. If I have X and I have a point in X, any point in a topological space is a retract. The reason being is a, is a retract of that topological space because you know that the constant map, it's a classical exercise, the constant map is always continuous for a topological space. So that's what we mean by retract in topology. But what's great about this definition is that it generalizes. So I want you to think about this for, for a minute. What we have here, anytime you see this, you know, in, um, in, in category theory, anytime you see a statement like this, we have the composition of two maps equal another, I want you to be thinking diagram, commutative diagram, because what we have here is we can tran translate that definition of a retract into a diagram by saying this. Let me just set it up first before I explain. What we have here is that I say A is a retract of X if there exists an R such that this diagram commutes. That is equivalent to the definition that I have presented to you. Okay? And this looks like something that's very, very general that we can definitely generalize to any category, which is what I'm about to do. So, I'll show right on this line. Definition, let's see be any category. If A and X are two objects in C, okay, we don't need to use subset here, we don't need to use subspaces, then A is a retract of x if there is a commutative diagram. I want you to note here, no notion of an inclusion map, no notion of continuity, no notion of subspaces or subsets. It's a very, very general definition, but it does fit 
with our subspace definition for topological spaces. Okay? So, uh, I will just say, you know, I'll throw some things out for you who knew some, well, if you know more category theory, you already know this. In a concrete category, we're not going to talk about those, but if you're into it, in a concrete category where you have this notion of, of set, of objects that behave like sets, okay, a retract is always going to be surjective. Okay, so this, so the surjectivity does generalize to other spaces. Now, there is, you, what you can do is, um, now the author presents this and I want to explain it, it's not impervious to the development of today or tomorrow or any day, necessarily for now. But there's this notion of, of morphism retracts, okay, so the retract of a morphism, okay, so we're not working with space, we're working with morphism. We write if F is a morphism from A to B, G is a morphism from X to Y, then we say, that F is a retract of G if there's a commutative diagram. And I'll explain to you how this definition was born. Okay. So we have A, B, we got F going between those. We're asking that there exists function i, there exists a function r. I'm just going to set this up real quick and then I will explain it to you what is going on in this diagram. B, S, G, F. I think I have this correct. Okay, I have. I think, uh, yeah, I'm 90% confident this is correct. So if there's a commutative diagram here, we say that f is a retract of g, but what does this even mean? What we've done is, and what the author has done in uh, done in making this definition, he has basically it's the same thing as this definition here, but with a different category with different morphisms. Your category here, okay? So this is just all. Let me write this note. This is the same definition of a retract but for a category where your objects, those are your arrows or morphisms, and your morphisms are commutative diagrams or commutative squares, I'm sorry, not diagrams, that's very important, it's commutative squares. So, commutative squares. Let me think about this for a second. We have a morphism here, and through i and j gets translated to a morphism here. And what we end up with is a commutative diagram. And we're just assume for my explanation that f is indeed a retract of g, okay. So what we get is we get this morphism here and we translate it, okay, through this how morphisms are defined for this weird category into a morphism here in a manner where this diagram commutes. Likewise for G. And what you end up with is just the equivalent definition of above. You can view this as A, you can view this as your X, and you can view this as going back to your subspace A. And then these double arrows here, okay, well that's gonna be your inclusion and then that this will be your retract, okay? So these two arrows serve as your retract action. This is not, the notation here is not on accident, right? You have ij next to each other in the alphabet. You have rs next to each other in the alphabet. Those duly serve, not in the category sense, but they, they together serve as the retract, and then i and j together serve as that inclusion. You, it's the exact same definition. And note that this definition implies that A is a retract of X and Y is a retract of B. Because you have this imposed identity map here. Okay. Exact same definition, just a different presentation. I don't want you to get caught up on this. Because um, we will use it. We will use this uh, in a very technical way in the future. So um, it's just what you're used to do, what you're used to doing with retracts, but 
different objects and different morphisms. Another example of how category theory can make things very abstract, but nonetheless, it's not motivated, you know, by drugs or anything like that. Well, let's get off uh, categories and morphisms because I I'm starting to get bored of them myself. And let's talk about functors. And this would be, I believe, this is section two. Let me check real quick how I am on my time. Oh, great. Okay, well, we got time. So functors, we talked about morphisms between objects, but now we can talk about maps between categories. And to do that, we use functors. So let C and D be categories. A covariant, there's two types of functors, a covariant functor. Okay, so co together. F mapping C to D consists of the following. Uh, oh, consists of a function. Well, I'll say this, you know, before writing everything down. You know, think about it intuitively as far as how is this definition constructed. A category has two things. So a functor needs to deal with those two things. So a functor comes with two things, two mappings or, or, or two uh, behaviors. I guess you would say. Okay, it consists of a function, f, which maps the objects of c to the objects of d. So we deal with the objects in no particular manner. We just require this to be the domain and codomain. Okay, and for each x, uh, x and y that are objects, a function. All right, we dealt with the objects. We need to deal with the morphisms. Another function f that maps the morphisms, the set of morphisms between x and y, to the set of morphisms between the images of x and y. Hope you can read that. The order does matter here. It's very important. f of x is in the first slot, f of y is in the second slot. In general, for a functor, this doesn't need to happen, but covariant functors, this is important. Okay, so the order there, so don't get that mixed up. I don't expect you to, but just to say that, okay? Now, functors, I'll just say, oh, covariant functors must satisfy the following properties, okay? So for morphisms, we can separate, let me write a prettier G, we can separate the functor across composition. So f of g composed with f is f of g composed with f of f. f of g composed with f of f. Okay. How do we deal with the identity function? That's that special morphism. Well, the functor of the identity of x is the identity of the functor of x. So is the identity on the image of x under that functor. Okay, and that's for any object. Okay. Uh, I want you to think about this a little bit. Why we say it's covariant? F maps x to y. You know, the author made this note. And so f of f, that's going to map f of x to f of y. So it points in the same, as he says, he points in the same direction as f. Contravariant functors, it's a very, we'll get to the definition in a second. Contravariant functors, we just switch the order here and we switch the order here. So they'll go in the opposite directions. But right now, covariant, covariant functors, where the covariance comes from is how it deals with morphisms. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's do a claim. Wouldn't it be a lecture without proofs. I claim that if f is a functor from c to d, covariant, well, this works for contravariant. If f is an equivalence, I'll abbreviate, so is f of f. The converse, well, we'll talk about the converse in a second, but let's just prove it real quick for the, for fun, okay? Well, let's say g is the inverse of f, okay? So f of g composed with f is equal to f of f composed with g, because g is the inverse of f. It's a two-sided. Be, they'll be equal. This implies 
that f of g composed with f of f is equal to f of f composed with f of g. Okay. Now this has to equal, right? This is the identity inside on x. So this has to equal the identity on f of x. So this has to also equal the identity of f of x, the functor at x. Okay. Well, right here, this is the definition of a morph of a equivalence. So the functor of an equivalence is also an equivalence. The converse note. This makes for an easy exercise. I'll let you do it. It's a very simple. You'll see where it gets tough. It takes like a second to write down. Converse does not necessarily hold. Okay. But indeed, functors transport equivalences. Okay. They also, what's nice about functors, we'll say claim to, functors transport I'll write CDs for commutative diagrams to commutative diagrams. You can see this very easily, right? If f of g is equal to h, okay, in a commutative diagram, we're going to have f of f composed with f of g, okay, equals f of h. You know, and this comes from. This is actually very easy to see, and it's namely because of if we stay from the outset that in some commutative diagram, just think of a triangle f composed with g is equal to h. Well, it is necessarily the case that f composed with g has to be equal to f of h. Why? Because a functor is a function. It's well-defined. If this were not the case, then you would have a contradiction. Okay? Covariant functors are very interesting. We can really build a good supply of examples with them. I'm going to dig in here while we're here. Start, you know, I said what we'll do is you'll see throughout these lectures on category theory, You'll, you'll be in category theory for a while. You'll build up to some topological stuff. Then we'll go back down to some category definitions. And we'll just hint at, we'll, we'll kind of tease homotopy theory throughout this. Okay. But I want to define a functor called the fundamental group. And it's okay if you don't know what this is. But I'm going to name some functor the fundamental group. And we're going to define it as a covariant functor that takes the category of topological spaces to the category of groups. Okay, And I'm just going to say, I'm just going to give you two evaluations for it. We're going to say that the fundamental group of the unit circle is equal to the integers, whatever the group of integers, and then the fundamental group of the disk, so that's the perimeter, I'm uh, sorry, that's the guts of the unit circle, including the boundary. That's equal to the trivial group. Now, what is the trivial group? That is the group where the only element in that group is the identity. Okay. I claim to you, we're going to prove some very interesting results with this. Claim D2 oh, is not a retract of the unit circle. I want you to think about this in a you know sort of visual sense for a second. Okay. Here's my unit circle and then I have the guts. Think how could I continuously deform without cutting and breaking all those topological things? You know, topologists don't really think in terms of proofs, so we don't have to this time. I want you to think about how would I possibly deform the unit circle so that it fills up the disk. You can't. Okay, it's not it, you. You can't. But we're going to prove that, and you can prove that using actually what we know about functors. So let's prove it. Proof. Sorry, I'll try to improve my handwriting. So we're going to suppose for contradiction. So suppose for some notation for contradiction is a retract. Okay, so if it's a retract, then R composed with the inclusion function in the topological sense, okay, that's equal to the identity on the unit circle. Okay, well, let's just kind of mess with what we know about covariant functors. Okay, so we know that R, okay, what does R do? R takes 
the disk and maps it to the sphere. Okay, so R takes the disk and maps it to the sphere. So the fundamental group functor of R is going to take the fundamental group of the disk to the fundamental group of the unit circle. Okay, well, what's that? Well, the fundamental group of the unit disk, that's the trivial group. And then the fundamental group of the sphere we said was Z, was the integers. Okay, and then what about I? Well, pi is just the inclusion map. I'm sorry, I is just the inclusion map. I takes S1 and places it on the boundary of the disk. And that, therefore, takes the integers to zero. Okay. All right, we're going to start kind of seeing where a contradiction comes up. What we require out of functors is that since this is the identity map, okay, this, okay, this here, let me just write this out, so that maps S1 to S1, okay, R composed with iota, okay, so pi, the fundamental group functor of R composed with iota, has to be a mapping from the integers to the integers, and it also has to be the identity on uh, the sorry one sec oh they has to be at the identity on the fundamental group of s1 which is the integer okay the sorry give me one second okay well the problem with this is the identity map uh yeah the identity map on the fundamental group of the unit circle okay that's going to map integers to integer and so and it's going to have to be operation preserving it's going to have to be bijective obviously but we reach an issue when you try to separate this functor across their opponents in the composition okay and think about this for a moment what we start off with is one element the identity element that identity element e gets mapped to the identity element in the additive group of integers, which is zero, okay? And the inclusion map is gonna take zero to the identity element. You can see the problem with this. When I separate the functor across composition, I get the trivial group, or the, trivial, the identity map on the trivial group. But the identity map on the fundamental group of the unit circle is not the trivial group because we have other things to deal with in the integers than zero okay so here these do not match do not match and hence uh, we don't have what we want okay let me just check VC text again okay you guys are just talking about uh, surjective functors. Okay. Very nice. So, uh, what else should we cover? Well, this is pretty nice. What this gives us, and uh, if you've taken functional analysis, you've seen the proof. I think this is functional analysis. Uh, this is a theorem of Brouwer. And when you've heard that name before, you think fixed point theorem. This is it. It says that any continuous injection, so like injection means one-to-one, -one, from the unit disk to itself has a fixed point. What's great about this, we can prove it using category theory and what we know about functors. We don't have to deal with fundamental group or anything like that. We don't have to do any of that, which is great about this proof. But we're going to suppose for contradiction that there does exist well support for contradiction that f is an injection of the unit disk to itself that does not have a fixed point so f of x does not equal x for all x in d2 okay now we're going to say we're going to let r be the following function it's going to be a function that maps the disk onto the circle and my notation is not an accident it what it does is it'll carry a point x in the disk to r of x 
which is the intersection of the line through x and f of x with the boundary. So I'll just draw the scenario really quick. What we have is we have x, f of x. Remember, it's an injection. It'll map you to somewhere else in here. We'll say f of x. We draw the line, and we define r of x to be the point. I'll do this in a different color, hot pink, to the be, be the point where it intersects the boundary. Now, notice something about r for a second. It fixes all of the points on the boundary, right? If I take a boundary point, okay, and I evaluate r at it, it's just going to, again, map to the boundary point. Because, you know, this could be, let's say that's y. f of y could be anywhere on the circle. But the, the line is still going to pass through where y is. And so y is equal to r of x. So r is the identity on the boundary as a subspace of the unit circle. You might be able to see the problem with this. Here, r defines a retraction of the inclusion. OK, right. We have the inclusion that takes, that just places the unit circle on the disk. We can't, but this can't happen. We just, pr because if, if this could happen, this would state that D2 is a retract of S1, which can't happen. So contradiction. Contradiction, D2 cannot, by what we just proved, be a retract of S1. I really wanted to take you down the road with some examples of what we can do with retracts and how this can help us with proof. And there we go, we just proved the Brouwer fixed point theorem using this method. Okay. That's going to end our trilogy. Let me check my time uh, with covariant functors. I wonder if I have time to talk about contravariant. They're not too bad. Okay, it's 405. Uh, contravariant functors aren't very bad. Let me just decide, because I don't want to keep you here too long, what might be worth um, talking about. Okay. We'll go ahead, and I'll, I'm just going to keep going, if you guys don't mind. We're going to skip over some proofs for some properties for contravariant functors. Again, the goal here is to give you the, the intuition to motivate the definitions. You know, when the definitions pop up during your reading this week, it makes sense for you. Okay. We're going to define a contravariant functor. And so F will, again, be a mapping between a category C to a category D consists of, first, a function for objects. And it doesn't do anything different than covariant uh, functors do. It just takes the objects of C to the objects of D. Okay, And then, this is where it gets special. It also has another function, a function, let's put, that takes the morphisms between x and y to the morphisms in D between f of y and f of x. What is different here? I have reversed the order of the arrows. This is where the contravariant comes from. We've reversed the direction of the source and the target. Okay, And not only have we reversed uh, the direction of that, we've reversed the direction of the composition. Okay, So the functor must satisfy if I take the functor of the composition, that is the reverse composition of the functors. So I switch f and uh, capital F and capital, uh, capital F of f and capital F of g when I separate across the composition. Okay, But again, we still have the identity property that doesn't go anywhere. So f of the identity of x. Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. I'm going to try to get through this fast. Is equal to the identity on f of x. So that doesn't change. But what does change, what is most important about this, and I'll use a highlighter, these swap positions and these also swap positions. So keep that in mind when we talk about contravariant. Contravariant functors serve a very important role. I'm talking about uh, uh, dual scenarios, opposite stuff. i got to see what's worth uh, talking about. We'll just talk about some properties that 
contravariant functors also satisfy. You can verify these yourself. They are not, uh, they are trivial largely. Contras, I'll write for contravariant functors. They transport commutative diagrams to commutative diagrams. And they also transport equivalences to equivalences. Very, very easy proof. So they transport equivs too. Um, you know, some other properties about functors that I did want to prove, but there's not enough time to. If I compose two functors, I get a functor. Now, I am rushing these for the, and I'm not, you know, taking the time to prove them for the reason that the author recommended in the preface that really this should be a one day introduction to chapter one and chapter two. I would like to spend some time giving you the intuition so you understand these concepts, okay? But there will be times where there's technical properties that I will certainly, only in the first two chapters, this won't happen for homotopy theory, I'll gloss over technical results, okay? And then we have, uh, I should probably make a second, well, let's do another page. Okay, so there are some properties of contravariant functors. Okay, they'll come up later. We'll go back and use them. Okay. But I want to talk to you about the opposite category before we move on to natural transformations. So let's see the category. And this relates to contravariant functors um, largely. We can always talk about that another time. We form the opposite category denoted C op because it's overpowered, which has the following data. The objects of C op are just the objects of C. But the morphisms, okay, the morphisms in C op from, uh, we'll say, y to x. We obtain those by reversing, is obtained by reversing all the arrows in the morphisms in the original category C from X to Y. So what you get is, okay, if I have X going over to Y in my original category, in the opposite category, I'm going in the other direction. This is also called the dual statement. Okay, and in category theory, we there's a whole section on this in the book. In a category in category theory, when we have a diagram or a theorem that's represented in the diagram, the dual statement or the dual theorem is formed, you just take all of the arrows in the diagram and reverse it. And that there's this thing called the duality principle. We won't prove it. But the duality principle states is that if this is a theorem in a category C, then the dual is a theorem in the opposite category of that, the opposite of that category. Okay, that's this principle of duality. It comes up a lot. Uh, it turns a lifting problem into, in, into something else, uh, existence exhaustion problem or something like that. Okay, you reverse it and you get another statement. So that's this idea of duality. You will use this on your homework to form the coproduct, okay? Which uh, will basically generalize. Uh, we'll talk about you know disjoint unions and those sorts of things, okay? Now I want to talk about natural transformations. We have about I'll I'll go on for about eight more minutes, real quick. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I want to talk about natural transformations because when you see it, it's perhaps the most hefty definition of the reading this week. I want to talk to you about why it's called natural for a second, okay? And if you don't understand this, you know, we can certainly talk about this more next time. But uh, what you have here is, is, is really a definition that is natural in the sense that uh, going back to high school or maybe, f you know, the first couple years of college, you have vector spaces. So let V be a finite dimensional vector space. You can think about this for a second. What is V? What, 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 is, it, what is a finite dimensional vector space essentially? It is a copy of Rn. Any finite dimensional vector spaces, uh, or well, we'll say uh, real to make the argument, because technically it's your field. 
any real dimensional vector space, real, I'm sorry, real finite dimensional vector space is isomorphic to Rn. N is the dimension of your vector space. Now, what you can think of this is, is really a vector in V is a mapping from the reals to a tuple, an N tuple. V1, dot, 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 Vn. That makes sense, right? You take a number times the first basis vector plus another number times the second basis vector. You can view that. The dual of this statement is exactly what we just talked about. You reverse the arrow, right? This is a way to think about a, ve a finite dimensional real vector space. The dual of this, you reverse the arrow and you talk about sending a vector to a member of your field, in this case is R. Well, that's just a linear functional. This is a linear functional. You learned about these in linear algebra. Linear functional, real value and linear transformations. Now the set of all these forms the dual space. That's where the name comes from because it is dual to V. The dual space of V denoted V star is the space of all linear functionals. Let me know if this is illegible. I'm trying to write fast just so we can get through it. Linear, linear functionals on V to R. Okay. And it's a vector space. It has a basis. It's the same dimension as V. You can see this, but it's kind of weird. The thing that makes it not necessarily natural as far as the definition. And what I mean by natural is that you, you don't, it's not immediately clear what the basis is for this dual space. It's not. But we can certainly define a basis. We can just take linear transformations. We'll say EI star, uh, e, let's say e, E1 star, EN star, MV star. And you can check this as a basis. This is a very rudimentary exercise. Define by the following requirement that the ith linear functional, linear basis functional, evaluated at the basis vector in your original vector space, it's either zero or one. It's one if i is equal to j, and it's zero if i and j are not equal. Okay, so this is the Kronecker delta symbol right here, very familiar. Okay, all right. Now we can define a functor, define a functor, called the, we'll just call it the uh, dual functor. Define a functor. We'll just put a minus sign. This is the notation that's used. That takes the opposite category of your vector space, the opposite of the category of vector spaces, to the category of vector spaces. And it takes your vector space and it transports it to your dual vector space, V star, in the following manner. It's contravariant. So this is contravariant. Okay, what it does is it takes a linear map, so it takes a linear map L, let's say L is a linear map from two vector spaces V to W, okay, and it precomposes it with a linear functional. What I mean by precomposes it is that we, we get a linear functional and compose it before the function. What it does is it takes this Contravariant functor gets sent, so this gets sent to a linear map. We'll call it L star, which is a map. This is why it's contravariant. Uh, from the dual space of W to the dual space of V star by precomposing it with a linear functional. You might wonder why I'm bringing this. This will make sense later. Functional omega, which takes w to r, to get what we get in the end is we define l by taking, oh sorry, l star by taking l composed with that linear functional. Uh, what did I say? Omega. So that's what this functor does. Okay. Now. What, where we get natural again is in defining the double dual. So the double dual 
is just the dual space of the dual space. It's linear functionals on the space of linear functionals. So double dual, two asterisks this time because it's double, is the V space of maps which input a linear functional. So you input a function and it outputs a real number. Okay, well think about, you know, a very elementary example. Uh, think about one that evaluates a linear functional at a certain point. That would be an element of your double dual. Okay. Now, as far as where the natural naturality gets formed, okay, the isomorphism between v and v asterisk, right? We just basis vectors to basis vectors, and then you deal with linearity for the coefficients. Okay. So we have that basis. So the isomorphism, we'll just call it phi. Right, you can write down the isomorphism between the vector space and a stool very simply. It sends its basis, right? We can take the, I'm sorry, excuse me. We take this isomorphism between the vector space and its dual, okay? Then what we do is we just take the functor evaluated at that isomorphism. And that gives us an isomorphism, isomorphism between the star and the double, okay? You compose the isomorphisms, okay? So just compose the isomorphisms. The isomorphisms. And we get a natural basis for V double star. And why is it natural? I'll tell you why it's natural. It's natural because we do not deal with any of the basis vectors in V star in the dual space to create our basis in the double dual. Okay, so what, why this is natural? We assign a basis vector to its, we'll put in quotes, evaluation. Um, functional. Okay, what does this evaluation functional do? Ew, I'm almost running out of room here. We denote the evaluation functional by this. What this does, okay, we're going to input a linear transformation. The evaluation functional of one of the basic vectors of that linear transformation f is equal to f evaluated at that basis vector. This is very natural. Because you don't need to define, right? This is this 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 definition of our dual space basis is it's kind of abstract. It's not you know directly I would say defined as a computation of of your basis vectors. You know you don't input one of your basis vectors and it out uh, in in the original vector space and it outputs a basis vector in your dual space. What we do in the dual space is we just merely impose this requirement. But for the double dual, the reason it's called natural is that there's no, no, I guess I would say, abstract requirement imposed. You just take your basis vector and define a new one by just taking the evaluation functional. Very simple. It's, that's, how, that's why we say it's naturally formed. Okay? And this um, is why you, know, you, know, you might see people say, oh, it's a natural isomorphism. And I think to save time, what I'm going to do here, instead of writing out um, the definition, I would rather share with you quickly my notes for this. Okay, great. So you can see this. So that way we can get through this and be done because I'm taking up too much of your time. So a natural transformation. I mean, can I write on here? I can. Great. So given two covariant functors, a natural transformation which maps one functor to another is a rule that associates each object in and you remember, f and g are both same domain, same codomain. It associates with each object a morphism from the image of, of x under f to the image of g under x with the property that for any morphism in c, this will make more sense, I promise, when we get to the example of it, 
the diagram here is commutative. Okay, so what are we saying here? Okay, my, my morphism between the images of the same domain under the two functors composed within the image of the morphism under G is equal to the image of the morphism under F composed with this natural morphism here. Okay, so that's the technical definition, but it makes more sense when you talk about the example of vector spaces. Let's look at this in this then. We have a functional, right? We have that d -d double dual function. Uh, we have that, I'm sorry, morphism, excuse me, that will take, the, it's the evaluation, that takes a vector in V to the dual space in V double asterisk. 